It's my very, very great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. I suspect for, for many of you, Jamie Peck doesn't need a lot of introduction, but, but I do want to um, do some formalities. Uh, Jamie is the Canada Research Chair in Urban and Regional Political Economy at the University of British Columbia in Canada, but those of you who don't know him will be struck by the fact he still has a, a broad Nottinghamshire accent, so he's um, closer to home here than he is there. He's, according to the, the count up I did on the web page yesterday, either author or editor of some 10 books now, including his fantastic book called Constructions of Neoliberal Reason, which was published by Oxford University Press at the end of last year. And if you haven't already read it, do. This is going to set the agenda for scholarship in this area, not just for geography, but actually for the social sciences more generally. It's truly a terrific book. Um, he's also been working on a new companion to economic geography that's co-edited with Trevor Barnes and Eric Shepard, and I believe that's more or less, it's, it's out, is it, if I go and look for it on the bookstall? Book it's on, on the bookstall. Uh, numerous awards, including the RGS Back Award for contributions to new economic geography, and he was recently made an academician of the British Academy of Social Sciences. Now, as many of you will know, what his work does is track the vicissitudes of neoliberalism, and he's been doing this for some two decades now, from this was where I first started reading Jamie's work, all the way, all that time ago, on the other side of the world, um, but extraordinarily influential accounts, regulationist-inspired accounts of Thatcherism, through to what he describes, and this is a line from his new book that I really like, quote, the house-trained, mealy-mouthed versions that came to dominate during the 2000s. And as I said, Jamie's work in this area really has been at the forefront of scholarship. Um, one of the things I also really like about Jamie's work is not only does it make you think, but it's also always written, with, written and presented with passion. So I think we're in for a fantastic lecture. I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm going to ask you to join with me in welcoming Jamie and his presentation on the topic of Beyond the Neoliberal Zombie Land. Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you, Wendy, for the generous uh, introduction, and uh, I'm glad to see you all here today. Um, as Wendy says, I've been working on neoliberalism man and boy. Uh, in a sense, I uh, grew up with neoliberalism, uh, but I want to really uh, talk about this uh, from the perspective of the present uh, today uh, and think about uh, the conditions we face in uh, what I would characterize as the still neoliberalizing uh, present and reflect on our conceptual uh, approaches to neoliberalism and their adequacy in dealing with uh, rapidly transforming phenomena like uh, the ideology of neoliberalism. Uh, I think even if the effects of neoliberalization are judged to be pervasive, um, almost omnipresent all over the place, um, I don't think our concepts of neoliberalism can also be uh, loose and all over the place and leaky. Uh, I think we actually need uh, quite uh, well-defined uh, conceptions of neoliberalization in order to make sense of what is a uh, highly proliferating, highly unevenly developed uh, phenomenon. So I think the work of conceptualization, the work of method and so on is an important part of, of grappling with what neoliberalism means uh, politically uh, and what its limits might be. Um, now it's well known, I think, that left conceptions of neoliberalism explicitly or implicitly assume its imminent collapse. Um, you know, there's the joke that um, the left has predicted 10 out of the last three crises of neoliberalism. Um, uh, in a sense, we're always anticipating crisis, so we're never wrong when one comes along. Uh, but figuring out the relationship between neoliberalism and crisis is, I think, a rather more uh, complex problem. Uh, and what I want to do today is to um, grapple with that question uh, and think about the issues of ideological and macro-institutional reproduction, how it is that neoliberalism continues to reconstitute itself, uh, not least uh, through crises. 
Um, and I want to suggest also that it's important that we uh, use approaches to these questions of neoliberalism's reproduction, which don't slide into this uh, new binary that's been created of neoliberalism and post-neoliberalism, a sort of another uh, simple binary distinction, uh, but rather to find ways that account for the heterogeneous character of neoliberalization processes rather than bracketing out post-neoliberalism as some historic moment. We also need to find ways of confronting neoliberal hegemony, I think, without sliding into the fatalism that suggests uh, that we'll be living in neoliberal times forevermore and thinking beyond them is impossible, uh, but also without flipping over into the denial uh, that there is no such thing as neoliberalism and it's all a figment of the fevered imagination of a few um, recovering regulation theorists uh, like me. Um, so I think this means again grappling with uh, what in work with Neil Brenner and uh, Nick Theodore we've called the rascal concept of neoliberalism. It's a sort of unloved term, difficult to use. You have to spend inordinate amounts of time defining it every time you uh, invoke it. Uh, but I think it actually still does important work and so I'm going to try to defend uh, the case uh, for using at least a modified version of that concept. Um, let me start by mentioning uh, the rise and rise of neoliberalism as a social science uh, signifier. This is a chart I uh, like to use, uh, which gives uh, an indication of the uses of the term neoliberalism and its various hyphenated forms and so on in the social science literature. Um, you can see there's been an explosive uh, growth in this, but largely nothing really happened until the mid-1990s. So neoliberalism as a social science keyword is really a post-globalization term. It's a term of relatively recent uh, vintage and currency. Um, and certainly the use of it in the social science has little to do with the real histories of neoliberalism out there in the world, which go back at least to the 1920s uh, in actually existing state forms to the early 70s, uh, in some respects certainly until uh, straight after the Second World War where various experiments with neoliberalism occurred. <laughs> So neoliberalism has been out there for a long time, but as a social science concept, it arrived relatively late uh, and then has been used increasingly promiscu promiscuously. Another thing you should note here is that geographers, rather curiously, were first uh, to use the term. Uh, if you look at the mid-1990s, the uses of the term in the geobase uh, world uh, were basically all of the references to neoliberalism in the literature were being written about by geographers. Um, geographers remain the green part of the bar here, a significant part of this conversation, uh, but more recently I would say uh, it's been taken up by, uh, by anthropologists and, uh, particularly, and there's a much more broad social science discussion. So there's an interesting question about why it was that geographers were there so early. Is it because we're faddish uh, and like to use these new terms? Are we onto something? Uh, or do we use different methods? There are a number of potential explanations for that, but I think it is uh, kind of intriguing. When I mentioned that I think we need to confront uh, neoliberal hegemony, and uh, I'm glad I can agree with uh, Stuart Hall, which I always like to do, uh, on this particular point in a recent uh, paper of his in, um, in Soundings. Uh, Stuart Hall makes the following argument. The term neoliberal is not a satisfactory one. Intellectual critics say the term lumps together too many things to merit a single identity. It's reductive, sacrificing attention to internal complexities and geo-historical specificity. However, there are enough common features to warrant giving it a provisional conceptual identity. <coughs> Furthermore, naming neoliberalism politically is necessary to give resistance, content, and focus. Hall continues, Hegemony is a never completed project. It's a process, not a state of being, which is constantly to be worked on, maintained, renewed, revised. In ambition, depth, degree of break with the past, impact on the common sense, neoliberalism does constitute a hegemonic project. So I think this, I largely agree with this kind of analysis, and I would also agree with the need to see the production of neoliberalism's hegemony as a form of market rule as an ongoing process, not something that defines an era or, a, or, or is a sort of uh, static state, but is a dynamic and highly contradictory uh, process. 
And as Hall also emphasizes here, the rascal concept of neoliberalism is you know, one of the occupational hazards of working in this area, but one which I think must be uh, confronted. And I think if we're in attempts to think beyond neoliberalism, we also have got to deal with the challenge uh, that alternatives to the project of market rule will have to be constructed practically and politically on the terrain that Hall describes here, on a heavily neoliberalized terrain, which means that alternatives um, will have to take a particular kind of form to gather any wider uh, re resonance. So that's the preamble. This is what I want to do in three parts. Uh, firstly, I'll say a little bit about uh, the Wall Street crisis and the ideological service interruption that that uh, involved, and so what that's meant for the concept of neoliberalism. Secondly, I'll say something about how we might characterize neoliberalism um, in general terms, mostly theoretical terms. So you can't see these numbers here. And thirdly, I'm going to suggest a, a bit tentatively at the end two uh, more than neoliberal maneuvers, two ways of thinking about neoliberalization and what's beyond it, one more theoretical and one uh, more practical. The theoretical one uh, will draw on Karl Polanyi's um, arguments about the, the nature of uh, market rule, and the practical uh, step beyond neoliberalism will get into the realm of policy practice. Now, none of these have got the heroic status of post-neoliberalism. Um, I'll tell you that now. Uh, but I think there are ways of um, moving beyond neoliberalism, or at least starting the conceptual work of getting beyond neoliberalism, uh, while recognizing its uh, considerable uh, uh, weight. So the first part, then, is the world, Wall Street crisis as an ideological service interruption. Now, Larry Elliott in The uh, Guardian has written that the moment of ideological instability following the Wall Street crisis of the fall of uh, 2008 lasted approximately six months. According to uh, Elliott's uh, recent uh, revisiting of that uh, period in, in political history, uh, it was the period between September 2008 and the London G20 summit in April 2009 that there was a period of, of uh, ideological disorientation, flirtations with Keynes, invocations of Marx, um, mainstream commentators admitting that they had no idea what to do next, and so forth. So that was the period of disorientation. The broader issue, I think, is it was a very short period. Um, it lasted about six months, according to, to Larry Elliott's um, uh, view of this. And after that, he says, and I quote, return to a pre-crisis mindset occurred with remarkable speed. Um, I would suggest, though, that what we return to is not the same neoliberalism that existed prior to the crisis. It, this, again, has to be seen as part of an ongoing uh, transformation of the project. So it's not just about the resumption of normal service then, it's about the reconstitution of the neoliberal project. And in this country and in the United States in particular, we've seen uh, concerted electoral swings to the right, uh, quite the opposite as predicted by some who thought the death of neoliberalism would lead to a, 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 a historical advantage being handed to the left. Uh, we've also seen the widespread declarations of, a, of an era of uh, austerity. Uh, we've seen international economic policy discussions again reduced to Pepsi or Coke choices between a very narrow range of policy options. And this brief moment of pseudo-Keynesian stimulus in the United States and the UK and, and elsewhere has quickly passed into what Paul Krugman has called a, a process of learned helplessness with respect to economic policy. If you look at Obama's economic, the tragic state of Ab Obama's economic policy, uh, and no doubt this will uh, be again evident in his statement on jobs next week, um, the, with the waiting for Obama to pivot and turn and focus on jobs has been occurring now for several years. Uh, really, the policy space that he's got to do that is so fantastically constrained uh, that it's likely uh, only to be in the realm of symbolic politics, what Obama's likely to be able to say about economic policy. So we've seen this uh, real abandonment of uh, many questions of economic policy, failure to deal with the labor market crisis, the foreclosure crisis, and so on. And again, especially strongly in the, in, in the UK, we see uh, a renewed emphasis on devolution, uh, localism, risk and responsibility being downloaded to the lowest uh, scale that will 
uh, carry them. Um, so uh, again, neoliberalism has been reconstituted uh, in this crisis. Now, Neil Smith uh, wrote at, uh, in the midst of the crisis, in the fall of 2008, uh, that neoliberalism had attained a status of death, uh, but dominance. Uh, and what his, his argument were there was essentially that the intellectual project of neoliberalism had clearly faltered, uh, but it remained, for practical purposes, the dominant paradigm. Oh. Sorry, my format has gone a little wacky here. Um, uh, my rather more vivid uh, version of that was to talk about zombie uh, governance, uh, and zombie governance having a number of specific uh, characteristics. Um, I, I use this term in, in conversation with Loïc Vacant, who uh, had, has developed an influential argument about the neoliberal state um, becoming increasingly functionally integrated. So Vacant draws on Bourdieu's distinction uh, between the right arm and left arm functions of the state. The left arm deal, deals with social and caring functions. The right arm deals with oppression, uh, policing, military issues, and so on. And uh, Bourdieu's argument was that under neoliberalism, the left arm functions of the state, state have been systematically withering uh, over the years. Vacant's uh, updating of that argument was that right and left arms of the state were increasingly working in unison, and he analyzes uh, mass incarceration and the criminalization of poverty in those terms. Uh, where I differ with, um, with Vacant is in this suggestion of ambidexterity, uh, that the neoliberal state is acquiring these higher levels of functional integration. I still believe it's far more uh, contradictory uh, than that. But the, the zombie metaphor, and I don't want to take this too far, but at least explain to you why, why I use this title and I used the term a few years ago. Um, the zombie metaphor, in my uh, argument, was meant to signify uh, the apparent failure of intellectual and moral leadership that was seen on the part of neoliberal elites, uh, coupled with a certain tenacity as a form of crisis-driven uh, governance. And neoliberalism also, you can imagine the zombie walk at this point, uh, is repeatedly reanimated uh, by a form of technocratic uh, muscle memory, instincts of self-preservation, and spasmodic bursts of social violence. Uh, so the zombie metaphor did at least seem to be uh, moderately applicable. And we also saw, I think, at the time of the crisis, continued alignment with the primary circuits of corporate, financial, and political power. Um, it seemed unlikely to me that neoliberalism would be completely defeated at that moment uh, for all its uh, discrediting uh, because it still served the majority of dominant interests. And the reconstitution of neoliberalism essentially has been enabled by global conditions of overaccumulation, public austerity, indebtedness, growth chasing, beggar thy neighbor competition, and so forth, which creates a sort of political economic environment for neoliberal ideologies to reconstitute themselves. There's since been uh, something of a subgenre of zombie metaphors used to describe our current state. The Komarovs uh, use this metaphor when they talk about the wealth-sucking zombies of the occult economies of South Africa. Uh, ben Fine has talked about zombinomics, for example, uh, and the, uh, the abject failures of neoclassical economics in these terms. I don't want to take this too far, but the one thing I want to hold on to from the zombie metaphor is, of course, that zombies never know where to stop. Uh, they keep coming back, they co keep coming back, and they do very similar things. They stagger in a similar direction. And I think that there's a, there's a certain uh, quality of neoliberal governance is reflected in that, that they keep coming back and doing very similar things, uh, even if they're in essentially dead from the neck up at this point, uh, that the, even if the intellectual project has largely been discredited, uh, the zombies are still staggering on. So I think that speaks to the um, both the crisis proneness and the doggedness of neoliberal uh, governance in reality. The zombie metaphor might also easily be extended to conditions in the United States at the present time and uh, the form of zombie politics that has been uh, displayed by the Tea Party uh, in particular over, over recent months. Uh, this is uh, Grover Norquist, um, somebody who uh, Adam, and I, Adam Tickell and I interviewed a few years ago, runs one of the most influential think tanks in Washington, D.C., called the Americans for Tax Reform. And one of Norquist's uh, signature 
uh, ideas is this taxpayer protection pledge, uh, which you see um, Rick Perry, uh, the governor, Texas governor, current leader in the uh, Republican race for the presidential nomination, signing here, which essentially commits politicians for life never to raise uh, taxes, never to, raise, never to enact any policies that would result in a net increase in taxation. 234 of the 240 congressional Republicans have signed the ATR pledge, as have most, um, most state governors and so on. Even a few Democrats have signed it. Uh, and this sort of explains, I think, some of the uh, behavior of the Tea Party faction um, in, the, uh, in Congress at the, pleasant, at the present time. <clears throat> uh, are, the Republicans' argument for what they called cut, cap, and balance um, essentially amounted to a charter for permanent tax restraint. So the balanced budget amendment that um, John Boehner, the, uh, the Republican leader, presented to the House Republicans in the middle of that debt ceiling crisis a few weeks ago uh, would have capped federal spending for all time at 18% of GDP. Uh, to remove that spending cap would take two -thirds, a two-thirds majority of both houses of Congress that's a greater majority that's needed to declare war and a greater majority that is needed to change the Constitution itself. This was the red meat that was thrown to the Republicans to give them something to, a victory to claim to. They, they all voted for it, I think, without a single exception. 18%, uh, federal spending held at 18% of GDP was last achieved in 1956 in the United States. Um, and certainly would take a dramatic downsizing of government to reach that level. So there's this, the way in which uh, the Republican Party is operating in the United States at the present time, which certainly has this kind of zombie characteristics, it's almost a leadership, leaderless party at the present time, driven uh, by this barely uh, coordinated uh, animal spirits of the Tea Party, uh, and loosely coordinated by people like Grover Norquist at the top, but not by the Republican leadership. Uh, themselves. I think that in many ways characterizes this, um, this period of, of small state uh, fundamentalism that we've returned to. I'll skip over that point. <clears throat> so let me now say something about how we characterize neoliberalism, uh, given uh, that it clearly didn't die in the throes of the Wall Street crash, uh, that it has again reconstituted itself. The first thing I want to say about neoliberalism is that it's a multifaceted uh, phenomena that defies um, easy or singular uh, definition. And there are a number of faces of it that we might want to uh, identify. The first face I would characterize as its Polanyian face, uh, where we would want to emphasize the destructiveness of marketization and privatization, as Polanyi argues. Uh, but also the presence of uh, what he called double movements, uh, forms of social protection, which are kind of social recoils against excess marketization. This seems to be a significant characteristic of how neoliberalization works. This is Joseph Schumpeter. The Schumpeterian face of neoliberalism refers to its uh, intensive logic of creative destruction extended to the institutional realm, where neoliberalism is in a perpetual process of reconstituting its institutional apparatus. Its Foucauldian face um, draws attention to the fact that neoliberalism mobilizes uh, new forms of market-based and individual subjectivity, and it establishes new forms of discipline and control, uh, often at a considerable distance. Its Marxian face uh, calls attention to the logics of accumulation by dispossession, as David Harvey has described, and the, the entrenched regressive class redistribution that seems to be at the heart of neoliberal politics. Its Adam Smithian face um, calls attention to the entrenched competitive logics that are evident under neoliberal rule from the interpersonal to the international scale. And the fact that market societies have increasingly internalized those competitive logics, which constrains their imagination and their behavior. And finally, what we could call the Braudelian face of neoliberalism uh, calls attention to the way in which neoliberal rule has been interdigitated uh, with a realignment of global economic interests, with imperial reconstruction, and with ongoing financialization. Those are relatively autonomous processes. They are not reducible to neoliberalism itself, 
but they cre have created conditions of existence in which neoliberalism has continued to flourish. So it's a complex, multifaceted phenomena, uh, not easily reducible, I would say anyway, to a singular logic. Now, is this messy form of neoliberalism anything new? I'd say uh, not at all. In fact, it's been quite contradictory uh, and uh, something of a mongrel construction uh, from the very beginnings. Even as an ideational project, it was also um, something of a mongrel construction. And so when uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom uh, came out in 1944, the same year as Polanyi's Great Transformation, uh, obviously one was largely neglected, the other has acquired a considerable um, historical significance. Um, and Keynes, interestingly, took more of an interest in, in Hayek's book uh, than Polanyi's and wrote to his friend Hayek um, uh, about his thoughts on the book. He says this, uh, you admit that it's a question of knowing where to draw the line on the role of the state in the economy. You agree that the line has to be drawn somewhere and that the logical extreme is not possible. But you give us no guidance where, whatsoever where to draw the line. It's true that you and I would probably draw it in different places, but you greatly underestimate the practicability of a middle course or a mixed uh, economy, you might say. As soon as you admit the extreme is not possible, that is the extreme of the zero state economy in society, you are on your own argument, argument done for, since you're trying to persuade us that as soon as one moves an inch in the planned direction, you are necessarily launched on a slippery path which will lead you in due course over the precipice. I would argue that what Keynes had identified as a central failure in Hayek's argument, that there was no um, actual definition of the small state, uh, just a, 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 an injunction to press in that direction of minimal, minimalizing uh, the role of the state and expanding the role of the market. Uh, I think that, that logic actually is central to the way in which neoliberalization has worked. Neoliberalization itself repeatedly does lead over the precipice. It repeatedly does go too far in marketization, privatization, individualization, and so on. And, for, and in the sense that it reflects this zombie logic then of never knowing where to stop. There is no break on the project uh, itself. It's a process of rolling marketization which will only encounter its own uh, limits and contradictions. There is no, uh, in a sense, model of neoliberal governance uh, that would be defined by the neoliberal intellectuals. So for all of its stridency then, neoliberalism has never been associated with a coherent governing program either in theory or in practice, uh, but in fact is, uh, is, has uh, inspired a rolling program of market-based experimentation and perpetual governance failure. So I think this captures some of the reality of neoliberal governance, this attempt constantly to push in the direction of markets without any sense of what a, a stable resolution of market-state relations might be. And if we look historically, there are many different ways, many different ways in which the line has been drawn between the state and the market by neoliberal um, politicians and policy makers and so on. The history of neoliberalism can be told in terms of a series of contradictory interventions at the boundary of the state and the market, which of course are not in zero-sum relationship with one another. This is a qualitative relationship between state and market, which is perpetually adjusted uh, by neoliberal interventions. And what it produces is new hybrids of state and economy all the time, which have their own contradictions. So neoliberalism then unleashes this experiment without end uh, that is prone to repeated crises. So there is no equilibrium, there is no sustainable small state solution uh, that neoliberals uh, could eventually arrive at even if maniacs like Ludwig von Mises, pictured at the top corner there, uh, believed in certain forms of zero state, state solutions, his own followers wound up uh, going off into anarcho-capitalism and some quite strange uh, sets of uh, arguments for zero state uh, economies. But essentially, this, the line is constantly being moved between state and market, and there's no clear sense about where to place it. If you look, look at this, some of the geographic signifiers here, uh, Ludwig Erhardt at the top, the first, um, the, the, the architect of the German Deutschmark, um, uh, Pinochet, of course, uh, 
Um, this also raises the question about where, from which geographical vantage point we should rightly theorize uh, neoliberalization as a long-term historical process. Uh, do we view it all from the perspective of Germany in 1947, which was the site of one of the most immaculate neoliberal experiments, or Chile in the early 1970s, the UK in 1979, or wherever? I would argue uh, that neoliberalization shouldn't be theorized from any of these distinct geographical vantage points, but its uneven development has got to be understood as absolutely constitutive of the uh, process itself. So let me now make the uh, more theoretical claims that, uh, that follow uh, from that. Uh, to invoke uh, Polanyi again, I, I would suggest that neoliberalization invokes a stark uh, utopia. It's a utopian vision of a market society, uh, which is, um, as all utopias, ultimately unrealizable. So this means that neoliberalism um, licenses a politics of direction, not destination. It's a politics that constantly presses uh, towards the direction of deeper and deeper marketization without a, a sustainable destination um, in view. And so I think this um, explains something of the temper, the political temper of, political, of neoliberal politicians as well, because they never arrive at the utopian endpoint. They're constantly frustrated, uh, which is why they keep coming back, uh, as the zombies tend to do, uh, trying to uh, redo the things they tried to do several years earlier. So this constant pressure in the same direction, but constant failure, is the characteristic of neoliberalization, I would say. It produces a whole series of discrepant uh, formations. Uh, there's no historical trajectory uh, to or from a pure neoliberalism. There was no pristine place from which neoliberalism was diffused, either, either the Mont Pelerin Society meetings after the Second World War, um, uh, Thatcher's first cabinet. What, none of these are the pristine moments of neoliberal achievement. They are all um, hybrid models all intersecting in various ways with one another. So it's not moving towards a more pure form. Um, uh, it's, it wasn't pure in the past than it was in the future and so on. Uh, we're looking at a series of mongrel formations uh, because as a utopian project, neoliberalism is always incomplete. As a process, it never achieves uh, monopoly. So this means, and again this speaks to the um, political temper of neoliberal politicians, uh, is that it, it, it involves a series of unhappy marriages. Neoliberals always have to cohabit with their others. Um, they can never achieve a complete monopoly, but they cohabit with other state and social formations and all the actors associated with them. Um, so that means we see a whole series of neoliberal hybrids, neoliberalism hybridizing with social democracy, neoliberalism hy hybridizing with Chinese state communism, and so on. There's always another, there's always an outside to neoliberalism, and the outside is always extremely close to the inside. Every social formation is made up of that kind of hybrid formation. There's never been a 100% neoliberal system, and there never could be. So I suppose that's the one piece of good news from my otherwise generally gloomy uh, outlook, uh, is that this, this will never completely succeed, even though it keeps pushing in the same direction. This, all this means that then that hybridity and uneven development are normal, not transitional features of neoliberalization. The presence of hybridity isn't an argument against the, the, the fact that neoliberalism exists. The presence of hybridity is absolutely essential and necessary because essentially neoliberalism always exists, dwells with its others, if you like. There's a particular, particular role of crisis that I want to also draw your attention to. Uh, crises have been extremely important as moments of reconstruction uh, for the neoliberal project. Um, in a sense, it was born as a, uh, as a actually existing state project in the systemic crisis of Keynesianism in the 1970s. But neoliberalism has been repeatedly be been remade through a whole seri series of its own conjunctural crises. Now, the difference between the Wall Street crash of 2008 and the failure of Keynesianism in the mid-1970s when, in a sense, the ideological software collapsed along with an entire social order um, is that the social order that 
underpins neoliberalism was still largely intact after the Wall Street crisis. So the Keynesian crisis was a double crisis of an ideology, of an economic system, um, of a form of economics, um, and, and of, a, of a social structure. Um, we don't see the same kind of crisis of the social structure in the, in the more recent crises of neoliberalism. So uh, it tends to reproduce itself through these moments. So all this means then that neoliberalism is never complete and it, effectively what it describes, I would argue, is an ethos of restructuring, a perpetual ethos of restructuring in the direction of markets but never arriving at that destination. So this means that neoliberals in practice are condemned to live in the purgatory of governance, which they don't want to be there either. They would prefer uh, free markets to be spontaneously uh, meeting all of social needs or the big society to inflate itself for, to the point at which it could look after all of these questions. But it never happens. So neoliberals themselves are dragged into governance issues uh, rather reluctantly. This also means that neoliberalization is associated with systemic uh, policy failure. The policies that it propagates repeatedly fail, um, yet there's a kind of dynamic, it sort of leans into its failures um, and, and it fails in a forward direction. Um, it fails into further rounds of experimentation with governance, which is exactly, I would argue, uh, the dynamic that we saw after the Wall Street crash. Um, essentially falling forward into a series of light touch re-regulations of the financial system and so on. And neoliberalism will continue to lean forward into its crises and come up with new experiments until it encounters something traveling in a different direction that eventually stops it. Uh, like all zombies, it will carry on in that direction unless it's stopped. And so it tends to find solutions to these crises within an extremely constrained solution space. Again, I would say this is a characteristic of the post-crisis uh, policy debate. Um, and in practice, this means that there's a sort of constant adaptation within neoliberal tolerances, neoliberal ideological tolerances. What we tend to call governance um, is this process of endlessly reinventing institutional interventions to coexist with forms of market rule. And so you might say we've, we've got a, uh, a live experiment of failing forward um, being displayed by the coalition government at the present time. Uh, Stuart Hall's analysis of this runs as follows. The coalition government sees the opportunity to launch the most radical, far-reaching and irreversible social revolution since the war. Coalition policy often seems incompetent with failures to link things through or join things up. Uh, but from another angle, it's arguably the best prepared, most wide-ranging, radical and ambitious of the three regimes which have, since the 70s, been maturing the neoliberal project. Um, and again, my only quibble with this will be to you, the, about the word maturing. I don't think the, pro, the neoliberal project is necessarily maturing through, from Thatcher through Blair uh, to the coalition, uh, but instead it's, this is a series of um, iterations in this non-linear process of evolution um, uh, around sort of market solutions. So the coalition's constant missteps and so on on policy, uh, which nevertheless result in some sort of uh, revised position within neoliberal parameters, is exactly what you would expect, uh, I think, of uh, near the neoliberal policy-making process. These people uh, haven't figured out all the solutions. The solutions don't exist within their solution space, um, but they'll keep putting up proposals until uh, they encounter an unstoppable force traveling in the other direction. So this means then that if we're looking at the realm of policy and institutions and what neoliberalism looks like on the ground, it's this constantly shifting phenomenon. Yeah, maybe the ideology is relatively stable, um, but the practice and its realization on the ground is highly dynamic. Um, and so we can think of a whole series of ways in which the neoliberal project has evolved since the 1980s, from straight privatizations to public-private partnerships, from structural adjustment to good governance, uh, from deregulation to light-touch re-regulation, uh, from no such thing as society to the big society. These endless reinventions are 
part of the dynamic of trying to find solutions within this constrained space, um, but essentially a, in, in a context of continued contradiction. So this is what um, Adam Tickell and I call the difference between rollback and rollout neoliberalization, this tendency to dismantle alien social and state forms to replace them uh, in faulty ways with alternatives which themselves then break down and create this kind of dialectic of constant transformation. So this means that neoliberalism then is always on the move um, and you can't read it and fix it in a, in a static way from a certain policy template. The policy template is always changing. It has to ad adjust to circumstances because it keeps failing. Now, one other thing I want to say about the character of, of policy change in the neoliberal era, um, which is, again, not just a feature of neoliberalization, but I think a broader characteristic, is that we've moved into a, a phase of fast policy development, which um, I think has got very important uh, repercussions for the way in which we think beyond the neoliberal uh, moment. Now, what fast policy means um, in my terms uh, is a deference to global best practices and models, traveling solutions. Um, Richard Florida's creative city model would be one, uh, but there are many others. Uh, participatory budgeting out of Porto Alegre, um, microcredit schemes and so on, that now travel the world and policy making increasingly occurs in the shadow of those global models, which are never rep replicated directly, uh, but in a sense set the terms for discussions about policy. In this fast policy environment that we've seen, uh, there's also a growing reliance on pragmatic solutions and so-called ideas that work. Um, so in a sense, be best practice is often harvested from far off fields. If a policy works in one place, then it may be reconstituted as a model which can be uh, taken to other places and emulated. Fast policy, um, I mean, there's, there's a danger in using terms like fast policy in that we all think the world is speeding up, and that's just a, a reflection of middle age on my part, possibly. Um, but so it's just as all policemen seem to be getting younger, and so on, policies seem to be getting faster, um, music seems to be getting louder. Um, I actually think policy is getting faster, though, in that the development phase of policy, the R&D phase, if you like, has been shortened dramatically. Because five minutes on the web and any policymaker in Bolton Metropolitan Borough Council can produce a list of best practice policies in you know, whatever field uh, would be identified. And so this tends to essentially foreshorten the processes of searching for policy solutions. There's initially, there'll be a reach for the shelf for a, a portable solution from somewhere else. Fast policy regimes are also characterized by the cosmopolitanization of policy actors and action, a whole apparatus of management consultants, policy advocates, um, people who work for multilateral agencies and so on, who travel the world endlessly, endlessly now propagating uh, policy solutions. There's been the rise also of evaluation scientism, um, especially uh, control group evaluations of social policies, uh, randomized trials, which in a sense are uh, narrowing the parameters around which policy options are discussed. This is one of the most dynamic areas of American economics, the so-called randomistas are developing a whole series of, of uh, methodological approaches to doing randomized trials of policy on a sort of medical model of where you've got a policy off population and a policy on population, and you measure the effects. And policies that are seen to work according to these randomized trials tend to travel extremely fast in the global system. Uh, they become models which, with a sort of scientific backing. Uh, and in many ways, this kind of shift to the way in which we're now evaluating policy is, is producing um, uh, more policy mobility. And there's this vast infrastructure of, of uh, policy intermediaries like consultants and so on that I've mentioned uh, that in a sense uh, move around these policy ideas. Now Beth Simmons and, and others reckon that these fast policy systems are here to stay, um, that we're going to live in a world, incre no policy making system is an island anymore, we're looking at an interconnected globalizing system and even after neoliberalism is long gone, we'll still have these fast policy systems. So alternatives to neoliberalism will have to inhabit uh, 
and thrive in this environment, I suspect. So this is where I get to my um, um, po more than uh, neoliberal manoeuvres, and I want to just call attention to two things um, that might be ways of at least thinking or acting beyond uh, the current um, reach of neoliberalisation. The first uh, is to uh, go back to Carl, Carl Polanyi, and uh, in a sense this is not going back to the written works of Polanyi, but anticipating where his project was going, which I think provides a whole series of resources that have been little used uh, in geography and in some respects in the wider social sciences to this point, uh, but can be extremely valuable uh, at this kind of moment of deep neoliberalization. So the loose uses of Polanyi in geography um, have tend mostly focused in economic geography. Initially, they were relatively micro-sociological. Uh, all the influential work on networks and so on got going in the early 90s, um, heavily influenced by Mark Granovator's uh, version of Polanyi. We've also seen Polanyi invoked in geography in a polemi polemical way. Uh, in a lot of the literature on, on neoliberalism, for example, Polanyi's critique of market fundamentalism in the 19th century uh, and his tirades against uh, the destructive behavior of markets uh, is one of the things that's often been turned to. What we haven't made much use of, I would argue, uh, is the analytical legacy of Polanyi, which is a fascinating combination of what he called comparative political economy, institutionalism, a degree of explanatory uh, pluralism, at least an openness to alternative explanations, and a form of macro-ethnography. Polanyi himself was not an ethnographer, but he made massive use of ethnography, especially in the first half of the 20th century, uh, to try to figure out uh, the complexity and heterogeneity of economic relations. In a sense, um, you know, just as Marx used uh, the, uh, the reports of the factory inspectors, uh, if Marx had lived another 50 or 100 years, he would no doubt have been using some of the same materials as Polanyi used from the start of the 20th century, uh, which spoke to the different ways in which economy was instituted and performed in different societies. Now, what Polanyi gives us is a form of what he called substantivist economics. Um, and I, th I think this kind of substantivist economic can be extremely valuable uh, in the analysis of uh, neoliberalized conditions. Because what Polanyi argued um, was that there's always the, essentially the co-presence of alternative forms of integration, that exchange or markets, if you like, um, coexist alongside systems of redistribution and reciprocity. He also talked about householding as a different form of economy. Um, and for Polanyi, none of these economic systems, either historically or geographically, ever achieved monopoly status. They weren't lined up as in a series of stages. It wasn't like humankind was moving towards markets away from other systems. Um, they coexisted in complex ways. So this is a, a license, I would say, for understanding economy as in a heterogeneous fashion. Uh, with the coexistence of markets and non-market forms and figuring out their complex intersections under different geographical and historical conditions. So Polanyi insisted that marketization is a real but incomplete process. In some respects, it echoes uh, what I was just saying about neoliberalization, that movements to marketization were often uh, responded to through double movements of social protection. They could be um, uh, politically regressive double movements in the form of fascism. They could be pro progressive double movements in the forms of, uh, of various, of the welfare state and so on. But there was inevitably some sort of dialectical uh, reaction to excess marketization. So there's a dynamic at the center of Polanyi's thinking, which is about markets, their limits, reactions to them, which is, I would argue, where a lot of contemporary politics is, is, is currently played out. He also claimed that non-market alternatives, while ever present, uh, must be analyzed relationally, not separately. We don't sequester uh, these different forms of economic system like reciprocity, redistribution, and exchange into separate forms of analysis. We need to analyze them together and in relation to one another. Now, Polanyi, as I said, didn't entirely lay out this entire program, 
um, in part because the latter part of his career was spent in the United States and under the shadow of McCarthyism, uh, which uh, some fascinating work on Polanyi has drawn attention to the fact that he, a lot of his terminology and so on, uh, like the use of phrases like double movement, uh, was intended to distract attention from the essentially Marxian um, influences on a lot of his work. Uh, but essentially Polanyi's project was never completed, and especially he never applied his apparatus to advanced capitalism, advanced modern capitalist systems, uh, which was regarded as a kind of politically too risky uh, to do in the 1950s. And in fact, the students that he trained at Columbia in New York uh, were likewise defended that legacy and, and in, the, in the end drove his entire project into the sand by arguing that it really only applied to so-called tribal societies uh, and didn't apply to advanced market economies. That was a travesty of uh, Polanyi's own view, um, where really his promise was to analyze these different systems simultaneously, uh, not separately. Now, where does this get us? Um, I, I think it can take us beyond some of the impasse in the current discussions around neoliberalization. One of the impasses, I would say, exists between uh, those would invoke a, a big N version of neoliberalism, classically David Harvey, uh, sometimes me, um, uh, essentially political economy analyses of neoliberalism, which have been at some tension uh, with more ethnographic accounts of neoliberalization in particular settings. Uh, Iowa Ong's work will be a good example of that. Um, and those ethnographic accounts often distance themselves from the big N version and, and wallow in the contingent relations while not actually drawing connections between uh, different forms of neoliberalization. And I think we've kind of arrived at a bit of an impasse in that discussion. I think Polanyi's approach allows us to recognize this difference uh, and connection at the same time. Uh, it doesn't necessarily lead us to sequester ethnographic work on neoliberalization, which has been extremely important, into a, a series of local exceptions, as I on calls them. Uh, an exception to what will be my question about her work on China. She assumes that neoliberalism is in its natural setting in the United States. I would argue neoliberalism is exceptional in the United States just as it is in China. It, it's essentially a hybrid system uh, in, in both settings. So we don't want to normalize neoliberalism in one place, call it exceptional in others. We need to, again, uh, analyze these systems simultaneously. And I think Polanyi would allow us to do that. The second way in which, um, and second impasse that he might able us to, uh, enable us to transcend uh, was, is the impasse between those that focus on neoliberalism as the kind of primary object of analysis, who develop neoliberal centric views, and those that develop, are developing separatist analyses of alternative economies. Um, some of that work on alternative economies and community economies goes out of its way to uh, deny the existence of neoliberalism and they end up looking like localized experiments in community gardening or whatever, um, which uh, are interesting at the local level, but it's not exactly clear how they link together with other alternatives to neoliberalism or how they fit with a heavily marketized world. Again, I think the Polanyi approach allows us to transcend that kind of divide, um, where we do need to do work on alternative economies, but we don't need to sequester it off from an understanding of the consequences of neoliberalization. Those two questions have got to be on the table uh, together. Let me wrap up with the, the second uh, of my sort of uh, more than neoliberal uh, steps. If the first is to think about Polanyi's, the, the value of Polanyi's apparatus for analyzing contemporary uh, social economies, uh, the second realm is a much more practical realm and that involves thinking about policy. Now, as I've already hinted, I think policy is a much more indeterminate terrain um, than would be suggested if you take a rigid view of how neoliberalism works, that there's a set of Ten Commandments, um, privatization and so on, which are carved in rock and are essentially always obeyed. I would argue that neoliberalism has never operated like that, but the policy repertoire is constantly being remade. So this means that the realm of policy, relatively prosaic realm, of implementation and policy development and all that kind of thing assumes some considerable significance. This is the realm in which neoliberalism often fails, repeatedly fails, in fact. 
Um, and so policy practice is something that um, many of us work on that kind of terrain. I think there are very there's very important work to be done uh, with respect to neoliberalization here. Now, fast policy regimes, of, as I've described them, are realized through this increasingly uh, global circuitry of actors and connections and models and rationalities and so on, um, which propagates mutating models, uh, mutating policy solutions that travel the world at great speed. And much of that uh, policy apparatus is technocratically reproduced by evaluation scientists, um, uh, actors in uh, multilateral agencies and so on. But it works in the context of endemic policy failure. The policies keep on failing, they keep having to be revised and so on. So at the level of pr policy practice again, there's a, there's a lot of action there which is often not fully taken, um, paid attention to. So uh, there are a number of questions about how these fast policy systems work. Uh, Nick Theodore and I in our work on this um, call this pr process by which policies travel from one place to another and mutate transduction which is a word from genetics, which means that the, it's about, describes the way in which a virus travels from place to place and changes the genetic form of, a pulse of, of the host organism. That s seems to us to be the closest description of how fast policy works. The fast policy is the virus. As it arrives somewhere else, though, the genetic makeup of the host organism is transformed and it becomes a different policy formation, which itself produces secondary and tertiary effects. So we don't know too much about how these processes work at the present time, but they're intensive, intensely geographical um, and I think extremely important to how neoliberalism is being reproduced at the present time through these fast traveling models. Raises the question also politically about whether it's possible to appropriate fast policy circuits for progressive ends. Can the left use fast policy circuits as conservatives and neoliberals have? Generally, the left tends to value policies that don't move very far. Um, we believe in organic development, uh, links to local communities, the very things that you can't easily move from place to place. Um, neoliberals and conservatives are quite happy with their stylized, essentialized models, the stuff that will fit into a consultant's briefcase. And to a certain extent, they've got a mobility advantage as a result of that. The, the question would be, can left strategies also become mobile in ways that doesn't undermine their integrity. And I think this means exploring the distribution problem in social innovation. Um, there's lots of alternative uh, policy options being developed by social movements and unions and so forth. Um, there's lots of work at the production end. What's happening in terms of the distribution end? How are these innovations being moved around? Uh, Eric Olin Wright has got his Real Utopias project, for example, that talks about uh, promising left experiments at the level of policy and institutions. We've had a lot of focus on how those are produced locally. I think there's a whole series of questions on how they might be moved around and moved from one location to another, which have been barely addressed, these distribution questions of fast policy. Is it the case that the circuits of fast policy is distinctively favor essentialized technocratic solutions or could they be used in different ways and I think all of this means that there's a different kind of work to do than waiting for the next kind of big bang systemic failure of neoliberalism I think if there's a one most sobering lesson from the from the Wall Street crash is that neoliberalism is unlikely to go down in a total moment of collapse like the fall of the Berlin Wall um, We've seen it constantly reproduces itself through those moments rather than collapsing in total. I think it's extremely unlikely. So let me just briefly mention an example of how this fast policy uh, system can work and actually yield some surprises. The example I've been working on the last few years with Nick Theodore uh, uh, is a social policy called conditional cash transfers, widely used in Latin America. Um, invented in Latin America, but now found in more than 30 countries. Uh, it's a rudimentary welfare system which is spreading across middle-income countries. Over 200 million people are in receipt of these grants. This is a vast, vast uh, phenomena itself. Uh, not a great deal of social science work on it yet. Um, but what conditional cash transfers do is they give very small cash payments to families uh, on, the, on the understanding they meet behavioral requirements. 
The kids go to school, they get their inoculations, there's regular visits to health centres and so on. But it provides cash to, for, to poor families on the, on the grounds that they behave responsibly. Now, the neoliberal origins of this, I would argue, are similar to the origins of workfare. It presumes that there's something faulty about the poor that must be corrected before cash can be handed over. It assumes that cash can't be given to men because they'll spend it on alcohol, so it is given to women on the grounds that they'll spend it on the children. Some of, there's some truth to some of these uh, uh, neoliberal uh, myths, uh, but they're wildly exaggerated. And the, the model of a kind of dysfunctional uh, poor family is the, the model that conditions this idea of a, a conditional payment. So this was invented in Mexico as a technocratic experiment with tacit financial and institutional support of the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, this CCT experiment, in the late 1990s. As it traveled to Brazil, it was softened to the point that when Lula introduced it in Brazil, for example, he refused to police the poor. Um, and so he, he, his argument was that they'd use these policies, but they wouldn't actually enforce the conditions on families. Nominally, it was a conditional program, but it was operated with a lighter touch. And so uh, this had a huge, it actually shifted the GDP, uh, sorry, the, the Gini coefficient in Brazil in raising the uh, income for the poorest segment of the community in a measurable way. It also is reckoned to have got Lula re-elected uh, for his second term. Extremely popular, vastly important program, uh, but it's essentially an adaptation of this rather conservative technocratic model developed in Brazil with the World Bank and so on. So Lula operated it differently. When it traveled over to Africa, where it's now being used widely in Namibia and elsewhere, uh, it was softened further because in many African countries there aren't the state structures to police the poor in the way that they're policed in the Mexican countryside. So for practical purposes, it was impossible to enforce conditions. And so this means that soft forms of CCT now operate across southern Africa and in many other parts of that continent. And so here's, a, here's a, uh, an example then of a, of a neoliberal model kind of invented in the Washington consensus uh, with their allies of Mexican technocratic economists um, in Mexico City that has actually kind of run beyond the control of the, uh, the multilateral agencies and the neoliberal policymakers. It's actually started to become more progressive as it's evolved. And as it's moved from relatively high income to low income countries, there's this kind of condition element has been diluted to the point that it now raises the question, what would happen if we gave the poor money without conditions? Now, even though tens of millions of dollars have been spent on these randomized trials of conditional cash transfers. It's probably the most studied social policy ever. They've never asked the question, what if we don't ask, have the condition? That, that's the question that exists outside the neoliberal mindset. Conditions are essential for them. But DFID, um, some of the Scandinavian um, uh, charities and development agencies and so on have been funding small experiments in <laughs> Namibia and South Africa which are running these programs without conditions, just handing over the cash. And lo and behold, it seems that the poor do the right thing without being required to take these steps. And so this could actually end up a kind of circuitous route to a universal basic income uh, in Africa, which nobody would have predicted that as the outcome of this in the late 1990s in Mexico. So the realm of policy practice then is not some kind of Cinderella world where nothing of particular significance occurs, major shifts could occur here. Um, and it suggests that um, as analysts of social policy, we need to be working actively on these processes um, of the transformations of policies in the wild, if you like, and as they mutate between countries and systems. Um, and this means trying to keep up with this vast apparatus of randomized trials and so on. I mean, it's, we are outnumbered, I have to confess that. Uh, but there are interesting and important things going on here. So in the realm of policy practice then, uh, we could see the transcendence of neoliberal uh, policies through this systemic failure leading to alternatives. And, and anthropologists like James Ferguson are uh, writing interestingly about these experiments in South Africa and saying, yeah, we don't want to write off every neoliberal policy experiment in that it actually could lead to some unexpected uh, 
uh, results. So I'm at the end. Let me, let me just wrap up with a, a couple of concluding comments, and I'll be interested to hear your questions if you've, you have any. Um, I've suggested uh, here today that neoliberalism is um, deeply entrenched as an ideology, um, but is always incomplete and therefore always emergent. Um, in a sense, its frailty is that it can never uh, reach its own utopian destination. So neoliberalism remains a frustrated project. It always has to dwell with its others. And that means that the alternatives to neoliberalism are always co-present with neoliberalism. It never acquires that monopoly status. So I think the recognition of what neoliberalism actually is, yeah, maybe it is everywhere, uh, but it always takes these hybrid forms. It always has got its frailties. Its frailties in China are different to its frailties in the Czech Republic or a difference to its frailties in Chile and so on. So we need situated understandings of what's going on in these different settings. Um, so again, rec you can recognize neoliberalism without having to end up being in the fatalistic position of, well, it's everywhere, it's controlling the entire agenda. It never entirely controls the agenda. So that, that is the basis for, for my argument that neoliberalization as a rolling process then should be understood as a prevailing paradigm of restructuring, uh, restructuring institutions, society, economy, and so on, which is flawed, but dogged and persistent. Um, you know, the zombie walk, again, is the, uh, is the metaphor that I want you to think about here. Um, this is a rather, um, it's maybe have, has sort of limited capacities in some senses. It keeps trying to do the same kind of thing, uh, but it never will achieve uh, its long-term goals. And the two maneuvers I've suggested um, or at least responses to, I think, where we currently sit. Uh, firstly, we can be insistent on theorizing neoliberalism amongst its others uh, to find uh, its hybrid forms and the, and the many different forms that it takes, uh, not as a way of, again, fatalistically underlying its omnipresence, uh, but also as a way of analyzing its limits and its geographically uh, patterned limits. So that's the Polanyian maneuver, if you like. The second maneuver is the policy practice maneuver, um, which means doing different kinds of work in the shadowlands of policy implementation, uh, not always widely recognized in our field or others, but where I would argue there are extremely important things going on at the present time, um, and we need to track uh, some of these globally fast-moving policies to find, again, to find their limits and mutations uh, rather than merely to affirm a story of endless neoliberalization. Thank you very much.